Kubernetes. But the, right now, the ITCD community is not growing. It's not thriving. There are a few maintainers that have their primary jobs and they need to also to, to look after ATCD. And sometimes it takes a lot of time to introduce, not just, you know, to introduce new features and capabilities to ATCD, but, you know, just to do that basic maintenance work that is needed for Kubernetes for other projects. So those are at least two reasons that I am aware of. There might be some other reasons. Because eventually the Kubernetes community created a project that is called Kine. And Kine, what, what Kine does? It's a translation layer. Translation layer uh, between Kubernetes and relational database. What it does? Why is it necessary? Let's say that you belong to one of those companies that found the reason to replace CTCD with some other database, like relational database. And Kubernetes itself, Kubernetes, it does not support other databases by definition. So if you want to replace CTCD, you need to use some translation layer. For instance, if you use Kine, and Kine is uh, one of those well-known community projects, you still will have Kubernetes. And Kubernetes will continue uh, using ETCD, ETCD APIs. So like whenever you deploy any part, your service or deployment in Kubernetes, Kubernetes will be calling using ETCD API trying to talk to its ETCD database. But if ETCD is not there, then Kine will be intercepting those ETCD calls and Kine then can route those calls and use, let's say, Postgres or MySQL instead of SQLite. So this is what CD does. It's ETCD does. It basically intercepts all those APIs calls from uh, Kubernetes, and then it can actually use Postgres, MySQL, or another relational database as a meta store. And then throughout the presentation, you will see how you'll get to the distributed database. Because next, that's the agenda. This is the quick introduction to you. Why we need this conversation and what's, how we are going to achieve uh, the Kubernetes deployment on a distributed SQL database. What's coming next? Right now, we are switching to another tab in my terminal window and we'll start and we'll, we'll deploy first Kubernetes on Postgres SQL. So Kubernetes will be using Postgres as its own meta store. And after that, we will uh, do one extra step. We will deploy Kubernetes on a multi-region distributed Postgres SQL version. You go by the way. So Kubernetes, like Postgres, as Peter was saying, it's a database that was designed for single server deployments. However, these days usually you want to have something that is scalable and highly available and in Postgres ecosystem has many solutions. One of those solutions is Yuga by DB. I'm talking about Yuga by DB because the company pays me because I'm bullish about Postgres and I believe in Yuga by DB, all right? Take the whatever explanation you like most. But generally speaking, for me as a developer, it's much easier just to use Yuga by DB because it's even though it's distributed, for me as an application developer, it's just one connection string to my database and I don't care like how the data is sharded, uh, distributed, how the fault tolerance works. I don't care. For me, it's just one database connection, same as with Postgres or MySQL. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's do this. So what I'm using today, I'm using my laptop, but also I deployed uh, three VMs in, uh, in the United States West Coast. Of course. So I have a uh, virtual machine running here, West 2, that's Los Angeles. Then we have another virtual machine in uh, Oregon, West 1, and West 3 is Salt Lake City. I will, I'm already connected to West 2. Yeah, I think, let me come here. Yeah, that's my machine on West 2. It's here somewhere in Los Angeles. And I will be using this machine to deploy my Kubernetes instance. And then also I already have on this machine Postgres running. So remember the first step is let's deploy Kubernetes on Postgres and see how it works. Uh, yeah, let me connect to actually, I will connect to this instance from this window. And to connect to Postgres, Postgres actually comes pre-installed with Ubuntu. And uh, I will connect to Postgres this way. I am using PSQL, I am connecting as a Postgres user. I'm connected and here as you can see that my database is empty. I don't have any tables, I don't have any data. So now 
I want to start kind. So kind, if you Google for kind, you will find this GitHub project. It's part of the KA3S. This is the lightweight version of the Kubernetes. And here is take a look at this extensive documentation. But at least it's straight to the point. Kind is the translation layer that allows you to use Kubernetes with SQLite project, MySQL, and NETS. I don't know what NETS, NETS is, but hopefully some of you know. How do we deploy it? Let's actually start with Kind first. Before we deploy Kubernetes with Kind over Postgres, we can do this. I can, yeah, I need to go to my local folder because I have already cloned Kind I'm here. And the next step is, it's written in Go. I'm starting Kind and I'm asking Kind to connect to the following endpoint. And uh, the first, the beginning is the backend because Kind supports several relational databases. I'm using Postgres and this is gonna be akin to Kind and hey, please start and use the Postgres backend implementation. And then where is my Postgres? That's my Postgres username and password. And that's my Postgres instance. It runs local on the same machine. Okay, and I'm connecting to the Postgres database. Let's start it. It still works. And it said that the kind is available. Remember, here is I'm connected to my Postgres instance, and if I check the relations right now, here is you can see that kind successfully connected to my Postgres database running locally and created these two tables. Uh, you actually have just one table that stores all the metadata that is being generated by Kubernetes, and also you have the sequence. The database sequence basically generates IDs for the events because every event that is created and generated by Kubernetes, whether you deploy service, deployment, or whatever, it has a unique identifier, and uh, the kind generates those identifiers with the database. If you take a look at the structure of this kind table, and it's, it's not, there is no any rocket science. You have this event ID, name of the event, when it was created, deleted in different revisions. And also there are many indexes that were created to expedite some of the queries. Okay. So for instance, let's take a look at this. Uh, I can select ID name from kind table and let's uh, get the last three. Yeah, we, we have only just two events. So when kind started, he decided to write down a few events into this table. So that's it, that's fine. But now, that's how it works, but it's not Kubernetes yet. So how do we start kind with Kubernetes? Let me do this, I want to uh, drop this table for now. Let's do drop uh, cascade because I will be restarting kind with drop drop table kind cascade. It's empty again. For Kubernetes, when you use, if you check this documentation, it said that you can certainly run kind as a standalone process nearby your standard Kubernetes deployment. Uh, but today for the sake of simplicity, I want to use lightweight version of Kubernetes. So it's called by K3S. Anybody uses K3S actually? Yeah then it's gonna be like speaking your own language today. So K3S, a quick intro for those of you who don't know, it's basically, that's a minimalistic version of Kubernetes and what's, in, what's, what's valuable for the today's conversation and let's take a look at this component. It comes kind, kind comes prepackaged with K3S, which means that I can just start K3S, pass information about my data endpoint and then everything is gonna work fine, at least I hope so. It used to work for me in the past. Let's, let's deploy it. How do we deploy it? So what I will do, I will, use, I will use curl, I will connect to this web address and I will download a special installation script. This is actually one of the installation extract instructions for K3S. And then I will start K3S in the server configuration. I'm passing some essential settings. That's not the secret token. You need to use something more advanced, but this is what is interesting for us today, data store endpoint. And here is I'm passing this configuration. This, this endpoint looks exactly the same as the one we use for our just standalone kind deployment. And basically what will happen when I will deploy this Kubernetes instance on my local machine, then this endpoint will be passed and uh, Kubernetes will see that, yeah, uh, 
the user wants to use Postgres, which means that I need to go to Kine, and Kine eventually will connect to my Postgres instance. Let's start it. It downloads anything, something, it creates, and now it starts, it's starting K3S. We already have these two tables, and what I want to do now, yeah, it's started, meaning it, it, it will be running as a daemon on my operating system. And now, if you check this uh, ID and name, f uh, let's, uh, from Kine, right, we want to get from Kine, let's order by ID descending, we want to see the latest events generated by Kubernetes first, and then how about printing the last three. You can see that, take a look at this number. Kubernetes was started <coughs> barely a minute ago, and already generated almost like 600 events. Like, it's a stateful system. It like runs silent, it, it just runs silently, but it always does something. And I don't have anything deployed. If I do this right now, and, uh, and this number will keep growing. For instance, I will use this watch operator of PSQL, and I will keep executing this select every two seconds, and we will see that, yeah, something is happening. Something is being registered, I don't know, probably some heartbeats or whatever. I'm not a Kubernetes expert here. If you take a look uh, at this, uh, let's use uh, kubectl, get nodes. Uh, we have it running, it's running, it's ready, it's run, it, runs on my, uh, it runs on my machine. So this is how easy it is to deploy Kubernetes on Postgres. And so right now Postgres is used as your store. But there is one problem with uh, Postgres when you compare it to ETCD. ETCD is highly available and highly scalable and highly available. Postgres by default, no. Postgres is like single server instance, and if Postgres, you can deploy Kubernetes across multiple servers, across multiple availability zones, that's probably what you want to do, because, no, because if Kubernetes goes down, you don't want the control plane to go down. But Postgres, you need to find some high availability solution. And as I said, there are many options not many, but several options in the Postgres ecosystem that will help you to make Postgres scalable and highly available. They are just not built in in the core Postgres. And let's use Yuga by DB. So uh, today we will use Yuga by DB in this way. Let me first, what I will do, I will, uh, yeah, I will just destroy and stop the just created Kubernetes version, I no longer have this K3S installed. If I execute this command right now, you'll see that no Kubernetes is not found. And here is we will see that Postgres no longer gets any events uh, from Kubernetes because I stopped it. Let me just drop the tables. Yeah, I no longer need Postgres. Speaking about Yuga by DB, we will start introduction to Yuga by DB with the following command. And then I will explain you a little bit more. So again, I will be using curl to download the same installation script of K3S of our lightweight version of Kubernetes. And then for the data store endpoint, I'm telling, please, when you start, use Postgres backend, the Postgres implementation of Kine. But this time you will be connecting to the following Postgres instance. And here is, it's not Postgres instance, that's the Yuga by DB instance. I am using not the strongest password in the world, but that's my <laughs> database endpoint. And this IP address is, is here. It's the same virtual machine. And I am deploying a multi-node Yuga by DB cluster. Let me actually show you that multi-node Yuga by DB cluster, because one of the instances is running locally. Uh, Yuga by DB exists in several uh, versions. I mean, like you can, it's an it's a open source project, like Postgres. You can download and install and use it and don't pay any penny, or you can consume it as a cloud native fully managed database, it's up to you. I have this Yuga by D tool, and I want to check the status of my database, and I know that I store the data, uh, uh, the configuration of the cluster in the following local directory, so I can uh, go to this uh, directory and uh, get the information, Yuga by D, no, it's, it needs to be this way. So what I have, I have a three node cluster running, it's available, and I can connect to it. What we will be doing uh, right now, uh, let me use PSQL. I want to connect to my Yuga by DB instance, yeah, to this one. 
Uh, the port number is this one, and uh, the user is Yugabyte. I'm connected to Yugabyte DB, and as long as Yugabyte DB is distributed version of Postgres, it certainly supports the majority of tools and frameworks and libraries that you created for Postgres. PSQL is not an exception. I continue using PSQL. So I don't have any data in Yugabyte DB in my distributed cluster. So now let me start Kubernetes on Yugabyte DB. You will see that Kine also connected to Yugabyte DB, and it's already created the tables. What I'd wanna do now, let me show you actually that Yugabyte DB cluster and do a little bit more advanced intro for you. Yugabyte DB comes with this UI. So what I have, I'm running a three node cluster and I'm running this cluster in a multi-region configuration, which means that I have one node of the database deployed uh, here in Los Angeles, another one is in Oregon and the, another one is in Salt Lake City. Why I do this? Probably I decided that I want to tolerate region level outages. Region level outages happen and if let's say United States West 2 in Los Angeles goes down for any reason, my Kubernetes, if I also deploy Kubernetes in other regions like Kubernetes itself, right? During the demo I don't do this, then my database will be available, no any data loss and I will be able to uh, execute my application workload. Also when it comes to multi-region configurations with databases, you know that it's a distributed database. And by definition, distributed database nodes are interconnected through network and you already take that network hit, right? The latency hit because the network. That's why, especially when you deploy across multiple regions, that network impact on the latency can be even higher, which means that when you deploy across multiple regions, you need to find one of the ways how you can minimize the latency impact. For my today's presentation, I decided to write, I want to define one of, one of the preferred regions. Because by default, this is a distributed database. And when I have this kind table or any other application table that you create in the database, it will be sharded. Basically, your data will be split into shards and all those data will be distributed across all of your nodes. And then you can load balance your reads and write requests. So this is how you utilize the entire cluster capacity. But for my, let's say, use case today, I'm telling, yeah, for the sake of high availability, high availability, I certainly want the copy of the data to be stored in all of the cluster, in all of the regions, but I want to define a preferred region. The region uh, where nodes will be handling all the reads and writes by default. The primary copy of the data will be in one of those regions. So I selected United States West 2 as a preferred region, which means that Kine and Kubernetes, they will be executing quite advanced selects with multiple joins, et cetera, et cetera. And by default, all of those requests will be handled by the database nodes that are deployed in my preferred region. I don't want those joins to span multiple regions. So that's what, what I did. And we have, this is the new UI that exists in Yuga by DB, but uh, we have a little bit older one. I call it the veteran of Yugabyte. Uh, and it shows a little bit more advanced information. So that's my note in Los Angeles. And you see this leader preference priority. It means that the node, this node belongs to the preferred region, meaning that by default the reason rights will go to this node. If let's say the data center or region in the United States where it's true in Los Angeles goes down, then priority number two, this node will become the next preferred one, all the nodes. And here is in this configuration, I'm running just three node cluster. You can deploy as many nodes as you like in every region. It's up to you. Okay, enough. Now, if when you go back here, you can see that yeah, Kubernetes has been started successfully on Yugabyte DB. Uh, let's check it. Uh, how about we run the same request? I want to get uh, the latest events that are being generated by Kubernetes order by ID descending and let's print limit three. And let's do watch, uh, please repeat this request for me. Yeah, the Kubernetes is up and running and I can see that something is happening with the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, if I uh, do this, uh, let's do K3S cube, cube CTL, get nodes. Uh, we have it, but we don't have uh, any pods, we don't have anything else. And uh, generally speaking, 
It's easy. You saw like, like it took us how many? Yeah, 30 minutes and probably five minutes for troubleshooting. 25 minutes to deploy Kubernetes first on Postgres and then to deploy Kubernetes on a distributed multi-region database. It's only straightforward. And we used Kine. It's something that is maintained and created by the Kubernetes community. But the question is what? How many of you are DevOps people who are responsible for running Kubernetes? Okay. How many of you are application developers who are deploying Kubernetes? Yeah. So generally for you, it's interesting to learn those insights, but let's say that eventually we want to deploy our stuff on Kubernetes. Let's try to deploy something on Kubernetes to make sure that this configuration eventually works. I, uh, what I did, uh, probably you can come up with a better sample, but I just Googled and I found some repository with Kubernetes sample applications, and I want to use them today. So I will use this command, uh, I will deploy some emoji water examples. Have anybody heard about this example? Me too, me neither, maybe. But at least <laughs> let's, let's try to deploy it right now. And now it's gonna be deployed and here is, let's pay attention to, yeah, here as you can see that something is happening and uh, I stopped generating events. You can see that, uh, yeah, voting emoji water. So generally you can see what's happening inside, right? We are deploying, we application developers deploying something in Kubernetes and then this information is being stored in the meta store and Kine intercepts those ATCD API calls and eventually all this data is stored to Yuga by DB and it's replicated across multiple regions. So you're not losing this data even if one of your database nodes goes down and you have a meltdown in your region. Uh, let's restart this. So now if I do this, let's get information. So what was deployed? Yeah, we have several pods, yes, several microservices. Uh, then we have services, deployments and replica sets, pretty standard configuration. And this one is web, web. We can actually do an extra check. Let's say that my application was successfully deployed on the following Kubernetes configuration. But now let's make sure that the application is self response. I know that I can connect to this uh, endpoint and uh, check that, so yeah, we are good to go. Let's uh, use HTTP, get, and the port number is 80. Yeah, it's all good. So we've got some response from the application, HTML tag. So that's how it works. S that's it, that's it, it just works. Uh, it just works and it's uh, quite simple and quite straightforward. However, there was one, one uh, last, uh, one final item uh, on the agenda. Do we need to have any kind specific optimizations for distributed SQL? Because you saw that today, I, I, didn't, I didn't do anything. I just, I started Kubernetes using Kine and I use the Kine version that you download the, the, from the upstream of the project and basically Kine continues using the Postgres backend, but that Postgres backend works out of the box with the distributed version of Postgres. However, uh, if to be brutally honest with you, this like for my a friend of mine, colleague Frank Pashur, he sits here uh, half a year ago, sometimes we had that gig, when we want to find, let's say, some interesting well-known application that is written for Postgres and we want to check, all right, Probably it's no longer necessary. If, if, yeah, if you can try troubleshoot, yeah, like you guys. Like Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. And we, we actually came across Kubernetes, we came across Kine. And when we were deploying, a half a year ago, when we were deploying Kubernetes with Kine on Yuga by DB, sometimes the deployment would fail, sometimes it would succeed. Why would it fail on some occasions? We decided to check. Uh, that was related to the SQL request that were generated by Kine. Kine internally has just one single table, but if you take a look at the logs or if you take a look at the implementation of the project, you will find that it just generates like those massive SQL requests that need to join the data. And sometimes during the startup of Kubernetes on Kine, something would blow, uh, blow out and uh, the Kubernetes would not start. And eventually, uh, uh, Frank and I, we forked Kine and we just, you know, just created indexes a little bit differently. Uh, we also enabled some of their uh, optimizations for the distributed SQL databases. And our version and that version 
of kind and Kubernetes started working on Yuga by the bit. Today, when I was recording for this presentation, that was no longer necessary. But does it mean that we can just go ahead and use the current version of kind? Probably yes, it's all to go. But there is one important lesson for us developers. When you're transitioning, let's say, from a relational database and your application, you already have some application that was written for the database, you created it. And even if the database, like Yuga by DB, that is Postgres compatible, that's right, feature and runtime compatible, it's pretty much highly likely that you will take your application, you will connect, and it all will work. Still, then, run some load, uh, load testing, run some performance testing, because you might discover that you need to optimize some of the requests, some of this workloads that you created for Postgres or MySQL before. So that's why, Distributed SQL is the same SQL that works like a charm. It allows you to scale like beyond the cap capacity of a single server. It allows you to tolerate various outages because it's distributed, it runs across multiple nodes. But also as an, as an application developer, your learning curve will be much, much shorter because if you already know SQL, if you know how to use, if you're a Java developer, you use Hibernate, Spring Data, or you use uh, some other ORM for your programming language, it's gonna be an easy transition for you, but still, if uh, make sure you, you run some load testing and performance testing because still you might want to optimize some of the requests as long as your database runs over the distributed environment. But speaking about Kubernetes, if you go to the original configuration, Kubernetes is great. It uses a TCD by default. There are some of the use cases uh, when a TCD is not enough. It can be related to the scalability issues. Some of the companies are, have concerns about the state of the ETCD community, but nevertheless, you might have some other reason. Keep in mind that the Kubernetes community has special project kind that allows you to replace ETCD with another uh, meta store, another database. It can be Postgres, it can be MySQL, it can be Yuga by DB, whatever you prefer. Or, and if you, let's say, eventually listen to the presentation of Peter who kind of hinted and suggested that, guys, probably you can run If you have questions, please ask. If not, enjoy lunch. Questions? Going one, strive, strive. <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. Thank you for the amazing presentation. <laughs>